Our our scene again film this week is what year is it from? Nineteen ninety. Ninety ninety five. Nineteen ninety Barb Wire starring Pamela Anderson Lee, mm-hmm. uh, Tamora Morrison, uh, with a small part from Clint Howard. Oh, there's a lot of people. There's in this. a lot of people um, in this. But. The reason we decided to do this movie is because in the Pam and Tommy series, um, Barb Wire is about to come out, and it goes into how Pamela is getting fed up with Baywatch because she wants to be given more lines, and she wants to be, she wants to prove herself as an actress, and so she has this movie coming out, and there's a scene where she meets with her publicist and um they're going over how they're gonna market the film and work on their narrative and the career that Pamela Anderson most admired was Jane Fonda's um because Jane Fonda made she was like a girl next door and then she made these like films that turned her into a sex symbol and then she started making um, Oscar winning movies and that was kind of but the, the whole path time, that right. she wanted to take. And she also says that the whole time she's also practicing what Jane Fonda is now most famous for and that's her activism. Yeah. She's getting arrested at rallies and mm-hmm. fighting the good fight the whole time she's making these awesome career changes mm-hmm. and actually even to all the way to today she never really has seemed shaken by it. Yeah. Like she just does what she does and mm-hmm. just, you know, and I had never seen Barbed Wire, and apparently it is a movie that you used to watch mm-hmm. over and over. Not over and over. I saw it like <laughs> like I saw it when it came out when I was a kid, and I, I think I watched it a couple times, but it wasn't like a movie that I consistently watched over and over. Mm-hmm. Like I remember seeing it. Okay. I think I was too young for what you're implying. But <laughs> I thanks. didn't know that's what you said when we first talked about it. So that was what I automatically assumed but um yeah so um Pamela made barbed wire not that long after she and Tommy were married which I'm gonna have to go back and re-watch the Hulu series now because I'm trying to remember if she already if they had given her that tattoo okay before they met no because the first time we see it, it, it's like almost purposefully prominent in the conversation with her publicist. Mm-hmm. And before that, it's not there. There is a scene where um, the Carpenters, um, they're getting upset with Tommy because he keeps changing the layout plans. And he wants them to redo um, the bedroom. So they're out, like, in their van, like complaining and then Tommy and Pamela come driving out and she does have it well, on I her mean, arm which may or may not have been when they cuz they never really address when she's shooting mm-hmm. they just address when it's already done but i believe they didn't start shooting this until after they were married because um i read an interview that she did have so there were some issues with this film there was um originally going to be a different director that dropped out so then they brought in David Hogan who mostly directed music videos and he was like a second cameraman on um like Batman Forever or something like that Which and then second unit directors are generally and and this is we'll, we'll get into this more especially because it's one of the things that we outwardly notice but second unit directors are good at shots not putting them together. Mm-hmm. But um, she said in the interview, so all of that happened, and then um, she was recently married, and then she had some health issues, and um, I guess one of the health issues she had was she had an early pregnancy and ended up having a miscarriage. So that was something that went on like <clears throat> early on making the movie, but... Um, she, Pamela Anderson got the comics, dark, uh, Barb Wire started as um, a, a dark, comic, a, a dark, dark horse comic, and she really loved the character, um, 
the riding the motorcycle, shooting the guns, wearing the leather and everything. She said it was everything that she wanted to do in a movie. It was so different from what she was doing on Baywatch. And <clears throat> instead of having the makeup department putting this tattoo on her arm every day, she just went out and got an actual tattoo on her arm. That's how devoted she was to this character. So it is a shame like just how it turned out and um, everything like that and, and dark horse comics is a subsidiary of dc and it's all uh, well darker it's all mm -hmm. um you know blood and guts and guns and uh mm. sharp edges and it, I, I believe that it's gone under now I, yeah. I think it went under sometime in the mid 2000s but we actually probably, if I went through, I could find you probably five or six movies that were originally Dark Horse comics that nobody, um, that nobody really knows about. Hmm. So I believe Barb Wire first showed up in a comic in like 1993, and then there was, <clears throat> between 1994 and 1995, there were nine um, specific Barb Wire comics mm -hmm. that were published. Um, and then with this movie, there was also supposed to be a video game that was going to be developed. Um, that was never released. Basically, this was supposed to be Pamela Anderson's big break into the movies. Like what was supposed to launch her to be this big movie star. And it was a colossal flop. It was made for $9 million. Which and, is not enough. Um... It only made $3.8 million at the box office, and it did kind of tank her acting career. And then, of course, like, um, I think, yeah, that this was made 95, and then it was released 96, I believe. And then, of course, that was around, like, when the sex tape was mm -hmm. released. So. Which I also believe that the sex tape <clears throat> may or may not have had something to do with the film doing as poorly as it did. I don't believe the film was going to be a huge success regardless mm -hmm. with, with the way it came out. Yeah. But that happening simultaneously definitely didn't help. Yeah. I mean, it definitely made them very popular. I still remember the whole scandal with oh, yeah. it and everything oh, yeah. but um so yeah this was my first time actually seeing the movie and i love trashy things i love campy movies and sad to say i was really excited for this movie but it was not as fun as i wanted it to be i it, it was kind of disappointing um there were moments of brilliance i think like there was a lot of potential to this um like I the said opening earlier. sequence is pretty spectacular i have to say with her the, her like dancing oh yeah um, um there's also the water there's also well right at the beginning we get a scroll yeah <laughs> and i wanted to point this out because it's something that we both looked at each other when it happened and we went Wait, what? Because there's a scroll, and then ten minutes into the film, the character, Barb, mm -hmm. actually just reiterates everything the scroll said. I don't even know where to begin. Overall, this, yeah, this movie was, like, a mess. It was a it mess. It was all over the place. The tone was all over. Um, so, essentially... Um, this movie came out 95, 96. It takes place in 2017 during the, um, the second American Civil War. Almost more accurate than it, uh, yeah. meant to be. Yet it still feels so 90s. Like, you watch this movie and it just takes you right back to the 90s. Oh, like, yeah. Um, <laughs> there are cool images and one of the things we said was the the star of the movie is the um the star of the movie is the the costume designer mm -hmm. because everybody in the movie looks great mm -hmm. um the the congressionals 
that they obviously are <clears throat> almost Nazis. Mm -hmm. Um, Barb through the whole film has a really cool aesthetic. Um, even like the the Tamura Morrison character Axel. Yeah. So apparently Barb Wire's ex is Boba Fett. Yeah. Oh, if you're not familiar with Tamora Morrison, uh, he's always been Boba Fett, and mm -hmm. and now, pro, uh, predominantly in the book of Boba Fett. One of the things we noticed was in this film, not bad at fight choreography. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. He he looks good doing bad fight choreography. Except that one fight at the end. And I had to point that out. And it's funny once you see it, but we'll get we'll get to that. Yeah, so basically, so the year is 2017. Every city in America is under martial law, except for Steel Harbor and um, Pamela Anderson. Barb Wire. I, I feel like I'm going to keep calling her Pamela Anderson. Barbara <laughs> Kapinski. Yeah, um, Barb, don't call her babe, call her Barb, owns a club... And when the reviews for this movie came out, there were a few people, including Roger Ebert, who immediately saw the similarities to Casablanca. So you watch this and it does feel like it's... Kind of? Yeah. <laughs> well, like, they took almost, like, the story um, beats of Casablanca, the the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the story ideas of Casablanca and yeah. worked them into a post-apocalyptic film. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like, there are some really cool shots. There's, um, I don't know, it, it just feels all over the place. Like, you'll get random moments where suddenly there's a voiceover from Barb, and then you'll go long periods without one, and then suddenly a new one comes in. I felt like the director felt like he had to over explain things which is probably why like the movie starts with the scroll and then 10 less than 10 minutes later you have barb like it's a cool looking shot like the sky looks all red and she's like in the car looking out and then i liked her voiceover she has a nice sounding voice but it she wasn't does a needed. good character the whole yeah movie. well and that was the thing too like if they had a director who maybe was more experienced um, outside of just doing music videos where you ne you don't necessarily have to worry about line deliveries and stuff because um, going in, um, the character to me felt pretty one note. I was like, wow, like she's just delivering all of her lines the same way. And then we get to a later club scene where um, she meets with Axel, and that's like the first time we see this emotion from her. And it's because he was her like former boyfriend, and we get like a quick flashback to what happened to them and how he didn't show up, and he basically like disappeared. So she's holding a grudge against him, and there's this like quick shot where she makes him leave and then it's like she's getting tears in her eyes and then it just flashes to something else and I would have liked if maybe the director Stay on that. Yeah. Yeah. Because then it made sense to me. Okay, so she's been like so dry and cold this whole time because she is like withholding her emotions. Like it made it make more sense to me. But then they just didn't take it to that level and this is another example of something we've talked about before mm -hmm. maybe not on the show i think we may have mentioned it on the show but directors not respecting their audience's intelligence mm -hmm. and it's something that happens in a ton of movies when a director forgets that the audience isn't stupid you get things like added in needless adr a scroll and an explanation. Um, you get things like... It, it seems like last minute written dialogue. Mm -hmm. That the actor doesn't look like they've practiced because they just got it right then and there. And for some reason it's saying something that we've either already seen or we've already figured out. Yeah, speaking of really bad ADR, there's one line that came to me immediately. And it's after... 
the scene I was just talking about where um, Barb sees Axel for the first time and then we do finally see that emotion. Um, mm -hmm. And then Axel and Cora, his new wife, um, Cora's this doctor that the government is after. Um, they're walking outside and for no reason, we already got the idea of what is going on, and then it sounds so out of place because you can right. tell they just added it in. Right. Out of nowhere, for no reason at all, Cora's like, that woman's in love with you. And it's just, there was no which, reason. Which also, I don't even believe that it's that actress's voice. I it doesn't even sound like... I think it was, but it just sound it really sounded bad. out of place. And it was not needed. It was like, you don't need to, ex like, we, we get the idea. We just saw what happened. I don't, I, there were a few scenes like that that did make me laugh out loud. And that's not the reason I want to laugh at a movie. Like, right. I, <laughs> right. Um, some of the, the choices made here, like, there's a lot of scenes, um, a lot of dialogue that's like more, it's like exposition dialogue. Like it is really trying to explain to you what's going on. And then there's all these like, um, like blackout transitions happening. Instead of a transition, instead of just going from a scene to a scene, the edit blacks all the way out and then fades into the next scene. And it happens so often that you notice it. Or like a character is explaining something and it starts doing the blackout thing and then showing what is happening. And it's like, <laughs> which, and what? Then, which, which is funny because every once in a while something in the movie will happen and you'll go, oh, well, that was kind of cool. Yeah, like, like I said, there's moments where it's like, oh, this could have been so good. Like this cast deserved better like pamela yes. deserved better than everybody this. involved in this film deserved better <laughs> except for this this direct i i firmly under the belief that the production company and the director are the reason this movie turned out the way it did because you can tell actors wanted to do well mm -hmm. um in the moments where tamura morrison and um oh the actress playing the doctor oh why does her name skip my mind i forget Current. her name but they Maybe they were planning for a TV edit eventually. Well, um, most... Oh, I don't know. There's... I was surprised at the nudity in this. Like, there's a couple of... Um, yeah. Like, and it's not just Pamela. There's, like, other women in the in the background. But, and... I mean, Pamela really went for it. I was not expecting to see that, but that's why this is also a bummer, because I do feel like she really wanted to do this, and she really wanted to own it and which there is nudity in the comics yeah the barb wire comics there's yeah. also nudity um one thing i will say too i kind of wanted there to be more action scenes with her yes because i do feel like she did well in the action scenes. she did well in the action scenes and she did i feel like she herself got all the comics mm -hmm. and then practiced in a mirror what barb looked like in certain in panels because there are points in this film where you see barb oh, and like the the scene that's right there when mm -hmm. she's got her back yeah. to the to the table and like the one the one shoe out and the gun like pressed against her face that is a very it's an it's something that would be drawn not naturally done in a movie mm -hmm. so i really feel like she cared about doing about giving these these moments of seeing the actual character from the comic in the movie. Mm -hmm. And the crazy part is, physically, she actually looks just like... I mean, the character was drawn before Pamela Anderson was, you know, the star she was, and it just happens to be that she looks just like the character. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to look like the character in the movie. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple moments where she does her justice. Yeah. That's just a bummer, because I did see a lot of potential in this and it could have been so much better and then you've got like um xander berkeley um who's amazing Udo Kier, clint howard like this surprising cast in um, this movie you're forgetting one of the people who's awesome in this movie 
Uh, what's uh, David? Is it David Noseworthy? No. Jack Noseworthy. Jack Noseworthy. Yeah, he plays Charlie, her brother. He's really good in this. Actually, he was everywhere at that time. He's really good in this. Yeah, he I was... feel like he is a, one of the shining points yeah. of this film. Like at at this time in the nineties, like he was doing Bon Jovi music videos. He was in Event Horizon. Mm-hmm. It seemed like he was everywhere. He was everywhere. Um, and he looks, he looks like that point of the nineties. Like yeah. that's, that is what the cool guys looked like. He had this long flowing blonde hair mm-hmm. and he was, I mean, he was an attractive guy. Yeah. And then, I don't know. It just felt all over the place to me. Like there were moments where it felt campy and then other moments where it just felt too serious. Like the, um the fatso character that was a little mean-spirited well i was like well if you're gonna go there then why don't you have more crazy characters like that in right. this movie it was almost mad max yes that yeah. that sequence really felt like that to me and but then, then but like and conversely and we keep going back and forth on this but conversely you get the scene of her um with the foam explosives and the mattress mm-hmm. which is a super cool thing that she does. Mm-hmm. And you get the little the little uh, signal jammer that that her brother Charlie uses. And you're like, oh, that was kind of cool. Like, she knew it was there and it was, like, coordinated. But the yeah. audience didn't know it. That was, when you get scenes like that, you go, oh, well, that looks kind of cool. And then, the like, you want more of those. Like, yeah. Because those are the moments where it feels like, all right, Barb and Charlie know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, like the villain too, like most of the movie, he's like really serious. And then their fight at the end, he's more like unhinged. And it's like, where did, why? He, yeah. And what? I, I kind of, <laughs> like, I didn't, he, I didn't think he was a very like threatening villain I'm, because then most of his scenes too, you have Xander Berkeley, like cracking jokes behind him and making him seem like not threatening i feel like the xander berkeley character was perfect but the Mm -hmm. guy delivering the the main villain character needed to be much more like and again it's it's he the problem with that actor doing that role is the same problem as the rest of the movie is you need to either go campier or darker Mm -hmm. and he walked the line that makes it not entertaining yeah um either be like mustache twirling "Ah, i'm gonna get her or be the super dark one Mm -hmm. but he does a little bit of both and it kind of throws you off yeah i don't know this was just and i feel like the problem is we wanted it to be better yeah i like you know, like those, oh, it's so bad, it's good kind of movies, but it did end up feeling just average to me, which I was bummed because, like, you have that, like, awesome opening, and then she does have some good one-liners, and mm-hmm. some of her, like, action scenes were good, and... Well, a lot, okay, a lot of the action scenes with Pam are good. yeah. Um, there's one good kind of cool fight scene with Tamura Morrison's actual character where he's like taking down a bunch of no-name thugs. Mm -hmm. This is where we'll talk about that one scene. Okay. (laughs) So everybody knows that I am uh, a fight choreography connoisseur. One of my dreams in life is to shoot a film where the fight choreography is immaculate. And I feel like the closest thing we've gotten most recently is um, Extraction, where the fight choreography is completely on point and actually forwards the story. Mm -hmm. Which, them bringing that character back to life just ruins the first movie. I don't know how they're going to do that. It's stupid. They should have just let him die and like, oh, here's we're going to move on with the story of the little boy. It's a different episode. Anyway... There's one scene of cool action choreography, and then at the end, the Axel character is fighting, like, the main villain's second, and they're on top of a crane that magically is hundreds of feet in the air. We didn't see it get there. 
I don't remember. I was like, did I turn my head for a quick second? How no. did they get up there? Where did, where's the doctor? Where, where is... did, where did, how did the crane, like, originally when we see the crane, <laughs> uh, well, originally when we see the crane, it's, I mean, 50 feet high, mm -hmm. which is generally where those large mount cranes are. Mm -hmm. And then once we see it, when this fight scene goes on, it is... 120, 150 feet in the air. It is way too high for those cranes to be safely anyway. Mm -hmm. How'd it get there? Mm -hmm. But now, the main second and uh, the Axel character are on top. On top of it. Like, not in the cab. On top of it. And they're having a fight scene. And I watched it. And I went, hold on, Tara. Watch this. And I rewound it. And I said, punch dodge elbow to the back other person punch dodge other person elbow to the back mm -hmm. one more time run it again fall off the crane and it is literally that it is literally each person doing the same move the same sequence mm -hmm. three times and that's the whole fight scene and i couldn't believe my eyes, that they thought nobody would see that. It was shockingly lazy. Super lazy, <laughs> which, like, which, which is kind of bummer because both of the actors involved are trying to sell it. Mm -hmm. Tamora Morrison gives a good, like, step with it, and the other guy almost does, like, a Superman elbow as he's doing it. But they're trying, but it is awful choreography. And it, when fight choreography is so bad, you notice it. Mm-hmm. Then it becomes okay. Who 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 did that? And how how were when that was presented to the director? Mm -hmm. How was that person not fired immediately? If, if I'm a director and I'm not personally doing the fight choreography, which is never going to happen if I direct anything, but I have somebody doing choreography and they bring me something that's that lazy, they will immediately be walked off my set. To be fair, this might be have fair. been um, David Hogan's first time really doing action like this because from what I can recall, the music videos that he's done were for artists like Sheryl Crow, Shania Twain, Gretchen Wilson. Um, in the 90s, there was a, a Three Musketeers movie and Sting... Rod Stewart and Brian Adams had a song together, and I believe he directed that Is video. Is that the one with Gerard? The the one with the for the Gerard Depardieu Three Musketeers movie? I don't know. Or the I know one it for had the Oliver Platt Three Musketeers. Movie? That one with like Kiefer Sutherland. Okay. Um. Wait, I think that's the same movie. I don't there know. I never two. saw it. There was two that came out approximately at the same time, about Three Musketeers. I have no idea. Oh. Um. um so yeah, it seems like he's done a lot of like country music kind of music videos and well, I mean he worked on Batman Forever and I think Alien 3, but Okay. The Batman Forever fun. Not great. Mhm. Mm fun. I I I will defend Batman Forever to the people who Is that who the Vale Kilmer one? It is. That was a good soundtrack. It's a great soundtrack, but you also got, you know, you have Val Kilmer trying his best. You got Jim Carrey in his prime, and mm -hmm. you got Tommy Lee just completely uh, pissed off by the rest of the cast, and it shows. He, yeah, um, <laughs> notoriously you, hates Jim Carrey. Yeah, um, Google um, Tommy Lee and um, Jim Carrey. If that you've might be a future scene that again, that before, actually. But, um, <laughs> but um, so that's. But then we get to Aliens 3, and if you're a second unit director on a movie like that, mm -hmm. that went through three directors, mm -hmm. A, you're not getting any continuous advice from anybody. Because second unit directors moving on into, into head direction do well. Spielberg was a second unit director under, um, why did I just blank? George Lucas? Yes. Thank you, Jesus. But, like, that's, that's like, supposed to be the stepping stone. But when you're a second unit director under 
three directors on one film and you're not getting that advice that makes sense, you're going to have those wires crossed when you make your own film. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's one of the things that happened here. That and severe laziness. That's the thing about this movie. There's moments where there is great energy and mm -hmm. then there's like also moments of sheer laziness. Can we talk and... about how the last shot in this film... Can we talk about the last scene in this film? It's shot for shot, cut for cut, exactly the end of Casablanca. Where she turns around to she, look at the camera. She, well, she lets... She, they have that conversation. Helicopter's yeah. behind. Yeah. You see the helicopter just like you see the plane. Yeah. She lets him go. She almost get like... I, she gives a line that is not like a here's looking at you kid, like but almost and then she turns away and then looks at the camera and it's it's shot for shot the end of Casablanca oh it's a shot where um she and Willis the police officer played by Xander Berkeley they're just looking at each other and I forget the exact line that she says oh something he says something like i might fall in love with you and then she's like get in line and then it's just like these three cuts of her looking at the yeah. camera and then it goes right to credits the end of this movie <laughs> has one shot one here and that's it of diana lee and asanto mm. she's in this for one cut it's a second Diana Lee and Asanto, niece of Bruce Lee, daughter of legendary martial artist Dan Inosanto, for some reason is in this movie for 2.5 seconds. What? Why? That's so confusing to me. <laughs> because, like, I was looking through the cast and I was like, wait, what? No way. And then I looked up right as it shows her face, and then never shows her... Why? Why even? I don't know. Maybe it was, like, her trying to make her own name in acting. But, like, you don't really have to do that. She's a black belt in two arts before she was 20. She could probably just get into any action movie she wants. I will say, though, this movie does have a pretty cool soundtrack. It's very of its time. It's almost like like the Crow-sounding soundtrack. Yeah, like it's mostly um, cover songs. Like you, um, that opening sequence of her dancing with the water, it's a cover of Word Up, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. But and it's then, done like industrial. Yeah, that's the thing. And then that, that end credit song, it's a Tommy Lee song. I, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, there's, like, a cover of Hot Child in the City. And it's um, all, and it's all, like, industrial, it's all, like, uh, what do they call that? Well, I mean, yeah, industrial, but, like, like pre-grunge. Yeah, it's weird to think this and Strange Days probably came out, like, mm -hmm. around that time, because the soundtrack to that movie was pretty similar too and then in that one you have juliette lewis singing pj harvey songs but i wish um, we could find a better version of strange day <laughs> um so yeah it, it there's some you know cool shots and one-liners it has the soundtrack going for it um it has camille the rottweiler shout out to oh and she's actually she, like they, they do some cool stuff with the like one of the things that i was worried about was like we were talking about it last night and you were like or two days ago when we decided to do it and you're like oh there she has a dog and i was like that dog is going to be in this movie for two minutes and she's just going to stand there and i don't even want to bring up that they're probably going to kill off the dog like i don't think pamela anderson would have done this movie if they killed the dog right. but then they kind of do some fun stuff with the dog mm -hmm. Like, there's, the dog has a couple of scenes of its own. Yeah. That you're like, ah, oh, cool. Good job, Camille. The um, package check scene. Well, the package check scene is kind of <laughs> cool. That guy's a stuntman who's been in a shit ton of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's another bad guy extra in this who's a bad guy in 
every 90s action, low-budget action movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's that, and then uh, Udo Kier, who plays uh, basically the Sam character yeah. in this. <laughs> uh, Udo Kier plays her assistant yeah. uh, maitre d' at the bar she owns. Um, he is arguing with someone over talking to Barb about business. Mm-hmm. And he says, well, if you're not going to listen to me, you can take it up with her secretary, Camille. And he starts walking up the stairs and the Rottweiler almost bites his face off. Mm-hmm. It's a good, it's a good bit. It's a good bit. I wish it would have come back to somebody, a bad guy trying to run up the stairs and running into her, but like... I was hoping the dog would be in it more. Oh, but... the the scene where the, where she's like, you take care of Camille, and the dog, like, actually looks sad. I, yeah, I was kind of surprised at that. I was like, wait, she's gonna leave her dog? But, in her defense, where she was going was kind of dangerous. Yeah. So... I do think it's funny, um... One of the, um last lines of dialogue um when willis asks her where she's gonna go and she's like i hear paris is nice this time of year and it's funny because pamela anderson did end up moving to france when trump was elected yeah (laughs) she was like okay i'm leaving see ya yep and moved to france for a few years um and that that's our our recap our our re-look at 1995's Barbed Wire. Very 90s. Not as fun as I hoped it would be. It's it's a letdown because you actually want it to be better. Yeah. Yeah, I saw a lot of potential in this. You know, I always talk about... <clears throat> I always talk about movies I would remake better. Mm-hmm. I'd do this one. For me, though, it's hard to imagine someone else in this role. And it is kind of funny when you think about it that I don't think anyone else has tried to, you know, recreate this character. I feel like this... Or maybe there's such a stigma attached to it now. But now, now, but now, Mm -hmm. with the way people almost like long-form media more than films, Mm -hmm. I feel like this would be a decent series. Yeah. Because then you could actually talk about who these characters are, mm-hmm. what the motivate. A lot of this movie should have been the motivations behind people. Because one of the problems with the big bad here, I don't even remember his name, because it doesn't matter. But yeah. one of the problems with him is he's this super evil guy, and we have no idea why. He just is. That's the thing, too. I feel like it could have expanded more to make Barb feel more like a hero I didn't feel like it quite went or maybe like an anti-hero you know kind of thing also like like Bogey's character in what they didn't do is give that that feeling of like Bogey's character in Casablanca he's not a hero he's not an anti-hero he's he's looking out for himself but he's still just wants to do the right thing yeah like that he's a, he's a complicated character but he still wants to do the right thing mm-hmm. the way it's written i get none of that from barb it, yeah it does feel like she is mostly looking out for herself like yeah. you get these moments where she's you know working with the others but then like one thing will happen and it's like oh i'm just in it for myself again which if she was saying that so much like in a better movie she'd say that so much that you're that the audience is like all right you're trying to convince yourself Mm -hmm. or she would she would do selfless things and then say i'm in it for myself and the audience would be like Mm -hmm. you're you're trying to convince yourself yeah Uh, but this is not that movie Mm -hmm. (laughs) so let's move on because this is starting to depress me (laughs) okay 